Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the intersection of cannabis, the capital markets, and culture. On a weekly basis, host Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg of KCSA Strategic Communications speak with the CEOs, financial experts, cultural icons, legislators, and generally interesting people moving the cannabis industry forward. Today, Lewis and Ann are speaking with Jane West, one of the most influential women in cannabis. She's an entrepreneur, legalization activist, and CEO of the cannabis lifestyle brand, Jane West. Jane is also well known as the founder of the cannabis networking organization, Women Grow, and was named by Inc. Magazine as the most widely recognized female personality in cannabis. She's also a regular on my weekly podcast, Marijuana Today. This turned out to be a super interesting conversation, so don't sit back, lean forward. Now on to Jane West. Hey, Ann. Hey, Louie. Oh. <laughs> oh. All right, take two. Hey, Louis, how are you today? No, you can call me Louie. It's fine. We don't even need to do take two. We can just keep rolling. It's just painful. So um, a couple months ago, we were in Vegas for MJ Biz, and Shay invited us to do something that we both felt like total posers for, an, an all-star podcast of Marijuana Today. Um, and we met so many cool people, uh, but one of the people we met was Jane West, um, who is a true, like, badass in this cool industry. Cool chick. Just a cool fucking chick. Yeah. And I've run into her at a couple conferences. I saw her at NCIA in Boston, um, which, by the way, was a much better show than I expected. Um, what, was you, what did you think of her when you met her? I mean, I was just kind of in awe um, because she's just this like this this force. I don't know. She just has this really cool personality. She's very approachable, um, but she's just this like like force of nature person. Um, And, you know, we we were kind of just uh, BSing before the uh, before the recording. And then the next day when I saw her on the show floor, um, she came to me with samples and was like, oh, I wanted you to have these. And, you know, I had a great time talking with you last night. So she remembered and she, you know, samples of what? What did she give you? And she gave me the CBD, the day and night samples. Oh, I did um, get those. Yeah, um, which I thought was just really cool. And I don't know, I was just super impressed. And then I started following her on Instagram. And she, if you guys aren't following the Jane West on Instagram, you're missing out. So we'll make well, sure we and we're going to the show. We're going to talk about that too, because she has the most amazing, she is authentically her on that Instagram, right? I, I, I don't think that, you, you know, you always try and put your best face forward, like your Insta pose. Um, I don't see Jane doing that. I see Jane just being her. Well, yeah. And I mean, I, she's such a true artist, I think, which is really interesting and comes across. So um, I definitely want to talk to her about that as well. Well, that's cool. Um, and uh, the hashtag has not yet trended. So I am, even though I promised I wouldn't, and I'm not going to make the joke. So there's no more Marianne Ginger jokes ever again. Um, I will cut that shit out. You will never hear me do that again. Can it be considered a joke if no one laughs? Well, it wasn't a joke. It was a way to get in. Oh, you know <laughs> you what? You said it was you, a joke. It wasn't a joke. It was a mistake <laughs> and whatever. But you know what? It's fine. I, I've heard you. I heard Shay. And by the way, for those of you who aren't listening to Marijuana Today Daily, you should or Marijuana Today um, because they're both amazing. But it also gives you a sense of Shay's voice that you don't always. What the fuck am I saying? He does the intro to this show every week. I'm a, <laughs> that you can cut out. That the, all cut keep out. Keep it in. Wanna, keep it in. No, don't keep that in. Oh, my God. Can we just start talking to Jane, please? Jane, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you for having me. So we met, we were talking about this, Ann and I, that we met in Las Vegas at the Marijuana, the MJ Biz Show, um, at the Marijuana Today All-Star Podcast hosted by Shay. Um, And... I know that after listening to you and Chris Crane and everybody else talk, I felt like a total poser. Um, (laughs) That's how I felt when I started talking with all them, too. We fangirled. Yes. Oh, I fanboyed. You fangirled. Um, But you, you, one of the things that really, like, kind of blew both of us away is that you have built a brand 
in cannabis, right? You, you know, you're called the Martha Stewart of cannabis. How did that happen? How did you actually build your brand? How did you, what is your cannabis story? Um, well, I started in the industry in 2014 and I started my first business basically on the first day of adult use legal cannabis in Colorado. The first business I started was called Edible Events Company under the goal of bringing social use events into the mainstream, uh, which I still I am I still cannot believe this is not like a license you go and apply for five years later. It's amazing to me. Um, and so that was the that was the first business I started. And in doing so, in order to um, be able to to build what I wanted and kind of figure out the industry. It was really, I mean, back in 2014, so back in 2014, when I started my first LinkedIn account in the cannabis industry, you could type in the word cannabis and there were less than two pages of people who were bold enough to write the word cannabis. There were a lot more for weed and marijuana, but you know, it was a totally different time and place. And so I built everything up around my professional identity of Jane West. And I brought a new computer and I completed all my contracts. I started the different businesses in Colorado. And so, so I started doing events in Colorado and I was one of the only people doing it at that time. And as a result, I received a lot of media and press attention regarding my first event called the end of prohibition which is happening in Denver, Colorado on January 24th, 2014. And so at that very first event, because of its kind of like groundbreaking nature, there, there were almost more press there than there were people. If you include like bloggers <laughs> and other people I let come. Um, but you know, it was a lot of people well, were in. Well, it, if podcasting is, is, is also news and bloggers have to be news, we have to count them. Right. Oh, no. Oh, no. Definitely. Definitely. Of course. Of course. But there weren't like lifestyle, like actual, like the type of influencers that we're so lucky to have in the space now. Um, that like market wasn't there. It didn't exist at all. Um, right. So we had a lot of bloggers and um, and other and food people also as well. Like I had been working. I really wanted to also promote through my events. I wanted to promote the local arts in Denver. And so it was at a private art gallery and there were local chefs making food. So there was also press there from like these other kind of circles. Um, and one of the first art big articles, I, the first big article I ever got was on the cover of the food section in the Denver Post. Um, so to make a very long story short, as a result of that very first event and some of the news coverage that I received around it, I was asked to leave from my job in corporate America where I had been working for eight years. I ran uh, the Western division of the company. Um, I, I was... I had, at, it was, it came as a complete and total shock. And it was the result of me simply hosting cannabis events. Um, and so that became a second news story. Um, so the first news story was, hey, this woman threw an event and it's a weed event in Colorado. But you know, once, once stories are told. But they, were you, so were you a big smoker? I mean, was cannabis a big part of your life? Yeah, no, definitely it was. I mean, I, I just was, I mean, people close to me know that I prefer cannabis and that that was always true. Um, and I just prefer to alcohol. I'm just like not as good on alcohol. I mean, I went, I grew up in Wisconsin. I went to the university of Wisconsin and alcohol was ah, really prevalent go through. Oh, yeah. Go Badgers. Um, alcohol was very prevalent. Like I worked in bars from the day I like turned 18 and alcohol was very prevalent in my life. And it just, I'm like better with cannabis. <laughs> it's definitely, the better substance for me. Um, I prefer it over alcohol. And so that was why I was me too. Like not even close. I, I, I can't stand being drunk and I despise being hung over. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, and there's just the older, it's also just so now that I've really like totally flipped, like when I first started in the industry, it was really important to me to host social events where, where alcohol was also present at the time. I could have hosted events really easily where there wasn't any alcohol in just like a room. But the point was to make this normal. And the point was to be able to allow my husband to be there and have a beer and like ha let everyone just go out in a normal social setting. Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, I definitely prefer cannabis to alcohol and that was just always, so that was always the case. And so when it became clear that the voters of Colorado were going to, like, we were really legalizing marijuana. There was a, there's stores very close to my home that were like ready to open their doors on January 1st, 2014. And I was like, I am going to start 
And I'd spent my whole life as an event planner. I mostly worked for nonprofits. I have my master's degree in social work from Denver University. And so I produced um, these 10-day experiential education programs for high-achieving high school students. That was the job I had. And um, wait, what was I saying? I'm so sorry. I got off on point. That's okay. But you, you, know, you, you mentioned something that really piqued my interest, um, which is this dichotomy between you and your husband because you're a cannabis person. And he's more of an alcohol person. Does that ever? He is not a cannabis person. He does so how, not. Does that have any there's... tension? Does that build? Is there any tension around that between the two of you? Um, no. There, but that's just because he's like such a great accepting guy. Um, I think there's, there's, it's never been a problem. I mean, candidly, after I got fired from my job and like things were really tumultuous, um, I like I'd never been. I've been. I've had a full time job almost my whole my whole life. And I'd never been fired from anything. <laughs> and it was very, like, it was a very traumatic 2014. Um, and it would have been great if he did consume cannabis, because at least then there'd be some, he'd be like, oh, well, at least you're like hosting awesome parties we can go to now. Um, but no, he's been super great through it. But that's just, you know, it's, oh, I guess maybe that's more just because it's always been part of me. Like when we first met and li lived in Brooklyn together, like there are bongs in my house and I nice smoke pot all the time. So um, it was just part of me from the beginning. It wasn't like a new thing. I find that it's interesting you're asking that because as I've been attending more events and meeting more people that are kind of like dipping the, their toe in the industry, it's interesting because they start finding great products they love and they want to use them more. And then they have to start like explaining to all the people around them that they're like consuming less alcohol and using cannabis more often. Um, and those are some interesting conversations and really help like change people's thinking really fast. Cause it's like firsthand people are like, I don't know. I think I I'm better with cannabis. So your brand and name is Jane West, which is your alias. Uh, what is uh, your life like as Jane West? Well, um, well just to be clear, everyone calls me Jane. Like when I started these businesses, I, it's, I started like a new part of my life. And so, um, I was never a fan of my maiden name anyways. It like my name ended up being like 11 syllables. And so uh, when I started doing this, I was certainly not going to get on the phone and start making hundreds and hundreds of contacts and repeating this name over and over again. <laughs> and so I wanted two syllables. I wanted something short and sweet and strong. And um, I wanted to just start this new kind of phase of my life. And it comes with uh, and so yeah, so everyone always calls me Jane and that, um, it's like a date and the 2014 and 15, it was more of like a daily reminder of what I'm doing and why. Um, and that was a time that I really needed that because that was when the industry was like really tumultuous and you weren't even sure if it was actually going to work at all. Um, now people are, you know, so much attention here cause this is working. Um, but at that time, you know, it was really, it was like a daily reminder of what I was building and why, and just to be very intentional in everything I'm doing. And so, um, that's really kind of where it came from. Well, I think it's just really interesting that you, you know, your name has so many meanings to it. It's a brand, it's your identity. Um, you know, it's, it's, how people know you, but it's also, it's so much more than that. So I, I just think it's really interesting that you went in that direction. Um, how, well, how is also, it? Also like we just have their married names. Like I, I started to become, I studied this woman named when grad school named Lucy Stoner. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> and actually there really should be a movie about this woman. Her story is amazing. And she was one of the first women to start fighting that like, we shouldn't have to give our names uh, we shouldn't have to take our husband's name because it was what delineated them as like property back in the day. Or I mean, still does, but whatever. Anyways, Lucy Stoner, her story is really interesting. And um, and so I kind of started to like, at, like become more of a feminist as I got older. And so some things that like didn't bother me as much, like taking my husband's name, started to like be something that I was like, I don't know if I would have done that again. <laughs> and so this was... <laughs> That was really like one of my primary reasons, honestly, with the brand was like, I just, I wanted to do something totally new. So on that, you know, vein, how else does feminism play a part in your brand? Well, um, I am a novice feminist in the way that just like, like I didn't, 
take classes in college. I didn't like, I don't have a bunch of, I couldn't like, I would fail the feminism. Oh my God. Do you need to take classes to be a feminist? Cause I'm totally failing. No, no, no. I I wasn't, I didn't as articulate in terms of like, (laughs) yeah, like when we got the right to vote and how like, like just, I wasn't as articulate in different, um, important topics that now I have a better knowledge base about. And as you learn and start paying attention to different things, then when you see those happening in the world around you, then you see it even more and then it changes the way you think about it. And so, so I'm on my like, journey. Um, and actually, you know, it's interesting because the first time I started really looking, like trying to be like, okay, wait, I need to take into account these important um like I need to make sure that I'm building the right thing when I started building women grow. And originally it wasn't women. Like it was, there was all these different ideas, but the word girl was fairly prevalent on my, like, um, my ID, like on, you know, where you, (laughs) where you write all the different ideas on the wall when you're brainstorming, the word girl was, was in a lot of different top uh, possible names for women grow. And then that was where I started reading some more articles and pieces about feminism. And it really, like, we don't have things in society for men wait, that are, g- that wait, use I, the word boy a I lot. hate to break in, but I, I think a lot of people don't know what Women Grow is. What is Women Grow? And then, and, and, and then, because what you're talking about is really fascinating, but people are going to be going, what right, is Women sorry. Grow? So Women Grow, so the first company, so after, uh, so fast forward, Colorado says there's no events. You cannot have cannabis events here. But I still did an event with the Colorado Symphony Orchestra at Red Rocks called On a High Note. And we raised money from the cannabis industry for local arts, like Bang. Bang sponsored the event and like gave them $30,000 cash in a paper bag. Um, And it was amazing. (laughs) And that also got a bunch of media attention. And I was on Nightline because of it. There's There's like an eight minute long special on it. And so, but at the same time, while, while my, while my like uh, attention to what I was doing was taking off because of the events, it was becoming very clear that the events would never be a good plan because I, they sent a SWAT team to my 420. So four years, five years ago, this April, they, I was hosting a wake and bacon brunch at a small <laughs> locally owned gallery that was on 420, which also happened to be Easter Sunday, which it is again this year. There's like so many crazy five year things happening. So it was Wake and Bacon. We had like bacon on sticks and a little mimosa bar. And there were 80 people. It was sunny. It was beautiful. I and want bacon on a stick. It was so good. It's like chili rubbed and there's like a honey drizzle on it. Oh my God. Oh my God. And, and then they were, it, were, making were they infused? Bakery. They were making bakery in the bakery and you could just walk up to the case and pick anything you wanted because it's all included in the ticket price. I, wait, so I'm awesome. sorry. Were these products infused? Uh-uh. No, no, never. No, everything was, it was an event because I mean, remember like no social use, like there's no events. So it was an event where you could buy a ticket and go to the event and cannabis consumption was allowed. And so like I followed all these rules. I had insurance from Lloyd's of London. We had a shuttle bus reserve that we made look like a train car. And that's where you could legally smoke on because you can smoke on private for hire vehicles in the U.S. and not violate the Clean Air Act. And, um, is that everywhere or just in, in, in legal States? No, it's why like shuttles and different shuttle based tours and businesses are still, um, doing well and prevalent and, and exist because like, that's fine. Like you can do what you want in this tiny little box for 20 people. Um, the, as long as, as long as you follow all the other rules, you know, so yeah, so we had a part. So anyways, so those events, so we're at this brunch and a SWAT team, literally a SWAT team, eight men in head to toe black, both had like two guns. And then like a whole executive team <laughs> managing the SWAT team showed up and uh, they ticketed everyone at the event. The, their goal was to make every single person hosting a 420 event five years ago, a criminal in some way in a criminal courtroom. And that way they could like hold us to probation and I couldn't host any more events. And so that's what happened. And, so, uh, so wait, so this was as you were forming women grow or where does this, how does this relate? No. Back so, to so that happened. So my very first event, so I came up with the idea. I consumed my first edible in like a, like a, like not a <laughs> one brownie from college. Like my first, like it was, 
like actual uh, commercially made edible in October, 2013. And I was like, oh my God, this is the future. I want to host events around it. And I created edible events and opened up all my accounts as Jane West in November, 2013. My first event was in January. I got fired from my job in February. I kept moving forward with the events for the next two months and formed a partnership with the Colorado Symphony Orchestra. But then in April of four, of 2014, this, they sent the SWAT team and they're like, you're not hosting any events around here anywhere. <laughs> and were you arrested? I, I was not arrested, but I was charged with criminal uh, mis- misdemeanor charges that I did plead guilty of. And so like I couldn't, um, I, on my probation, I couldn't host any more events for a year. So I started Women Grow. So women, so meanwhile, I'm like in the news all the time. <laughs> all these people are emailing me. And they're like, because I put my email out there everywhere because I was trying to start my own business of events, right? And people are emailing me constantly about how do I start a business? How do I get into cannabis industry? How do I do? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just got fired. I'm, what I'm doing apparently is, I'm a criminal. Like, don't, like, I can't help you. And, um, (laughs) And in trying to help a few people, like a few of the first people that contacted me, I was like, I don't know, maybe I can help. Um, what became clear was that marijuana legalization is a local issue and like, who, like who gets a license, where your business gets to be, what you get to make, who your, who your clients are, what your operating hours are, like all of that stuff is going to be determined on a local level. And so, um, local networks and lo- like getting a, a involved is how you can succeed if you want to start your own licensed business, if, right? So Um, so that was the premise behind women grow. So women grow. So like I said, like I have my master's degree in social work and in my previous position, I organized the same 10 day conference on different college campuses nationwide for, um, conferences of up to 400 high school students. So, you know, I'm creating women grow was more going back to the type of community organizing I had done before in my life, which was like, okay, this is the model. This is how we're doing an event. You guys all get together on the first Thursday of every month. I found another company called Women 2.0 that um, tried to change the gender disparity in the tech industry by getting women together on a local level on the first Thursday of every month. And then I co-founded the company with someone who the, that had worked for part for Women 2.0 for a while. So we like knew like things were happening, and uh, and so yeah. So I started so by so I founded Women Grow as a result of the. Um, demand that I was getting from my community about like, how do I get like people wanting to connect to other people in the sector? Um, and it came as a result of starting the events. And so, um, so we, my, I held the very first women grow networking event in Denver, Colorado in August of 2014. And CBS this morning did a short piece on that, that like we are getting organized and starting a, a professional network. And so as of today, over, 50,000 people have attended Women Grow Networking events. There's a national conference that happens every year. It's happening. It happened every year in the past in Denver because I'm here when I planned it. Because I was the national events director for Women Grow. And I built the rest of the company <clears throat> and all the staff so that it would have like a backbone and be able to like move on into the future without me. Because I knew I wanted to get back into events. And I knew then that I wanted to start making real products and stuff that like I couldn't even find, I had just had such a clear vision of the things I wanted to exist that didn't exist yet. And I wanted to really focus on that, but I needed time to figure out how I was going to do that. Um, and so, yeah, so I spent two years building women grow. And are you seeing, uh, I mean, while cannabis is definitely better than, than the fortune 500 in terms of women in leadership, um, it still is, is lacking, especially in the C-suite. Oh my God. uh, No, No, it's worse than ever. No, right. Um, and you know, are you seeing, I guess, are you seeing enough being done for, for women to get a seat at the table here or, or what could be done better? I mean, I get asked this question all the time and the biggest challenge is that like all these other foundational institutions from banking to tech to like, those are all also like Caucasian male dominated. And so 
like now we're going mainstream, but now we have to engage with all these other groups in order to be successful because we don't I mean, have VC our own- funding and and get and and all of the the bigger money coming in, right? Is and and I and I heard a statistic the other day. I'm probably going to get it wrong, so let me. Uh, we'll look it up. But I but I think I read that two percent of all VC funding goes to women owned businesses. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. disgusting. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> but and then it's and then it's all part of this. It's all just part of the system that you have to play in in order to succeed, and it makes it really challenging. I I mean I could have done. I would be in a completely different place with my business if I had decided that that didn't matter to me. So like my company is 80% held by women and people of color. And I just have been very, very intentional about how I built the company once I decided what I wanted to build and, and how I wanted to build it. So what is, what is your company now? What are you doing now? So now I make um, home goods, accessories, and consumables in the cannabis space, I have three different main verticals of the company and they're all intentionally very different, but all under the same brand because the landscape is just changing so much and so quickly. And you need to be able to meet that like kind of patchwork that's going to form globally as like demand increases. So like every country, there's just such a different Cultural. So can you be? So I've seen some of your products. I've seen um, uh, the the um, the dugouts and some of the other things. Can you describe what you, what you're actually producing? Yes. So the very first thing I decided to make in the space was a glassware line because I still believed at the time that I might go back in big with events, and I wanted by the time events cannabis events were legal again, I wanted to be able to have my own glassware at my events because I wanted glassware that was monochromatic and like all one color, like looks good, like just like other things we have around our homes and things you buy from Crate and Barrel that tend to be all white or all black or all one color. Um, I wanted glassware that was monochromatic. I also wanted pieces that fit, fit more seamlessly onto a tablescape. So I wanted to create a beaker that was shorter than a wine bottle and um, had a big wide base so that you could set it down and not have it tip over. So I had these very distinct ideas of what I wanted my glassware line to look like. And so I partnered in and did a collaboration with Grav, which was just the premier glass company. And, and I just, I totally synced up with Dave Daly, who's the CEO there. And we like totally had a shared vision so quickly. And, um, and so we created the glass line. And so that was the very first thing I brought to market. Um, but that's a collaboration and, and grab, they know glass. <laughs> they're amazing. Oh, they're stunning. I mean, you're well, and we'll plug your Instagram page. You're, it's the, the work is stunning. It's art. It's art, right? Yes. They, I, I think so. I mean, I, we, what we came up with just like, so exceeded my expectations because we like, were so strict about also having functionality and utility as like the primary. So it just, they just like fit in your hand so naturally. And, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're your grandma's glass. <laughs> they're like, I'm making them in mint, like a, like a milky green. So, um, yeah, I love them. They're, is that okay, what so the color is called? Yoki green? green? Well, no, it's called mint. <laughs> Mint. We, oh, okay. There's a huge debate. Is it jade? Is it mint? Is it? Um, it's actually milk glass. So we, but so milk was one of the words in contention as we figured all this out. Um, but no, it's called mint. So Jane, you you you've talked to me about this in the past that you're raising money for the company. Can you talk? I mean, you know, Anne said that two percent of all of all venture capital goes to women. How has the process been for you? I mean, have you, has any, what has been like the most surprising thing about it? What's the thing that's frustrated you the most and what's the thing that's pleased you the most? <laughs> well, the most surprising thing about it is that right now I'm, I still need, need to raise money and it's not easy. So that's the most surprising thing about it to me. Cause I would have thought that by now, cause like I'm revenue generating now and our different verticals are succeeding and growing and so at this point, this was the part where everyone was kind of like, it's going to be really hard to raise money when all you have is a logo on a piece of paper and a bunch of drawings of what you want to make. 
But like, once you actually have stuff and you're selling it, then you'll raise money really easily. Like, and so, um, but what's happened to, so I, within that list of ideas, so I have the glass line. So just to be, make the story comp- like uh, timeline. So I have the glass line and in creating the glass line with Brav, that was when I, I really like drilled down on what I wanted my dugouts and one hitters to look like, because that's what I always use was a dugout or one hitter, but I just like, they're wooden, they're 800 colors. I had this little thing I'd like kind of like stitched together from the container store. And I wanted to make a line of dugouts and one hitters. Cause like you, with my one hitter, you can take a one gram joint and fill it 20 times. And with the quality of cannabis that's out there, like you don't need a lot. And it's about like dosing and not having people um, overindulge in some of their first experiences and have positive experiences as they like get more comfortable with consuming cannabis and incorporating it into their lives. Like we don't want to get people too high when they're just starting. But I like it. I like the feeling just like people like the feeling when like a wine glass start, a wine starts setting in and like getting a little tipsy. Like I like that feeling, but we need to ease people into it. Um, and so we do that by dosing and having them take a measured amount. That's always the same. Like you, I can roll a joint that's super tight or really loose and people who are puffing on it are going to get different amounts of flour, but using a measured one hitter that has exactly two hits in it is a way that you can like measure it out and take just the amount you want. And so I wanted a line of dugouts and one headers that were also just like looked cool and had a functionality and utility where like every last inch of it was being used for a purpose. So I designed a four piece line on paper, but in order to make that designed four piece line a reality, I needed to raise $1.2 million because I need to like find someone to make it and then make it and then create all the packaging and then create all the instructions and then get insurance and then import it and then export it and then have it in a fulfillment center where I'm going to sell it. Um, and so, so that was the point in 2015 that I realized I needed to raise money. And the, and then, and so that's been one of the most challenging things in the whole process. And it's, it's, it's bittersweet because now there's just so much talk about investing in money and people are raising money and raising 50 million and raising and, I try to make myself, I feel better about it because I know they're not actually raising money. They're borrowing it. <laughs> and I don't know <laughs> and why. And they're giving that, away chunks of their company for it. Yeah. But they're also borrowing it. It's just such a, like, we just have such a bad, at least I did going into this, like, bad financial uh, skill set. <laughs> and so well, when you apply the word raising to money you're taking in that the people are expecting you to give them, like, at least four times back, like that's, that's borrowing. And so, um, so I've tried to keep that to a minimum as I built my company, but I I did. Yeah. So I set out to raise money. Well, we have a lot of investors who listen to this show. So if you guys want to get in touch with Jane, yes, email us email at me. Green Rush oh, or yes. email Jane directly. You can email me Do you have an email? Jane. Yes. You can email me at Jane at janewest.com all the time, whenever you want, especially if you have a checkbook. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm, um, yes. So, um, so yeah, so that's been the part, but honestly, see, this is where, if you really know what you want to build and why you're just getting there. Like, I'm just trying to get to this point. Um, and so as I needed to raise money, I, I very quickly raised money from a few key seed investors who absolutely, who they just like understood my vision and it was the right time and place. And, um, and I raised capital. And so that was great. Um, and then as then I had about half the raise left, so I had about $600,000 left and I needed more money now at an exact moment in time, because I needed to start buying the inventory of everything I had created. Um, and so that was in the fall of 2017. And I started looking into equity crowdfunding because it, Equity crowdfunding, our equity crowdfunding campaign served a whole bunch of purposes for, for the company. And part of it was also just my co-founder, Jesse Meehan and I were like, let's go just raise money from people. Like we were so frustrated by the amount of time and energy that went into different investor calls where my only goal was to like kind of change one person's opinion. But if we could put it out there and really expand our reach and the volume of our message and engage more people than like that's beneficial for me anyway, because it's like a touch point. And so through the equity crowdfunding campaign, you know, we had 
tens of thousands of people come to the website and learn about our brand. Um, the average time spent on the site is like over five minutes. They like really learn and study what you're doing. We were able to raise $189,000 from investors in 17 countries and I'm building a global company. And so that was huge for us and really made big inroads into these other countries um, with players there. And um, by, but the most important thing, and I think, you know, Lewis can appreciate this, especially from his perspective is that like, I was able to talk about what I'm building and what I'm doing, but because I was removed from it all by, t by having it be part of equity crowdfunding, um, it helped me really jump over all these hurdles for advertising and accessing customers that other brands experience in the space. We're like, you can't, we know people are making ad buys that they're not getting. We know there's like, like, you know, people dampen the, what people like, how we're trying to promote things and web pages get shut down after and Instagrams get shut down at like 60,000 people. Like it's amazing what's happening. It's amazing to me actually how, how it's all still succeeding like a giant commuter train, despite the fact that there's so many challenges to banking and advertising and marketing and everything and where you can and can't post things and all that stuff. Like it still is just moving forward at such an amazing pace, but um, but yeah, it's been really challenging. So by using equity crowdfunding and ha having talking about people investing in us as opposed to just like just buying our product, um, it really helped us kind of get through 2017 and 2018, where we're like now we're getting to those final dominoes in 2019, 2020, where like we're going to be able to buy advertisement, we're going to be able to have a, a solid marketing budget that's based on a plan that where we can use more traditional methods. And, um, and so, yeah, so the, doing equity crowdfunding really helped us as a brand because we were able to acquire 550 new, in, new investors and that are, you know, invested in the brand and what we're building. Um, it helped us expand on a global level to, um, with investors in 17 countries and those are just people that invested. Like people read about it from dozens and dozens more. And um, and how much of that came like it came from seventeen different countries? Like what's the percentage of that overall? Oh, um, it's like all the U.S. Okay. But, I mean, a lot of them are like twenty five dollars. So I also the other reason that equity crowdfunding was so important to me was that like I have a ton of people in my network that are like that they could see how hard it was for us to raise money for this new idea for the dogs and one hitters, and they'd be like if I could just give you like $5,000, I would, but that's not how it works when you're playing like the real, like, like you have to have accredited investors and you have, like, it doesn't work that way. And so equity crowdfunding allowed a lot of people that have been, had been following us and supporting us to be part of what we're building and part on the cap table, even though they're not actually accredited investors yet. Um, and so, and that was, that was awesome because now like our whole posse, is like along for the ride. That's awesome. Well, and and you. So, I, I asked the the international question because you do travel a lot, mm -hmm. um, and it looks like you were just um, in Barcelona. Not that I'm stalking you or anything, um, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little. You're supposed to. Uh, That's the point. <laughs> yeah, it's totally um, fun to watch you on. Oh, Instagram. it is totally. It fun. is really totally fun. Oh, um, I'm glad. Yeah, it, I love it. It is stressful. And, like it is one of the things that. If somehow, what, putting content out there on, on Instagram or yeah, I mean, yeah. because in a lot of most, what I've had to do is create my own a notebook for myself that I think about before the day. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to post this. I'm going to post that because if I just go in, I'm really building these businesses. So I don't have time. Like, like, well, you make it look easy. <laughs> okay. Well, good. thank you. That's good. Cause I'm always like smoking a joint on some hill <laughs> side. <laughs> Like, but it no, looks like fun. it looks like you're having a great time. I am it really no, does. I am having fun. But you just you get into the meetings and then you forget to make posts because we're like working on and strategizing. You mean you, you mean because business meetings don't make great content? <laughs> well, they do. But I'm just standing at this freaking computer like all the time, like like so. I don't know. That seems boring. <laughs> uh, we get it. We're in a lot of meetings. Um, so, and what is it, what is the cannabis culture like in, in cities like Barcelona? So I did, so I've, I've, we did Spanibus and then I've, in the past, I also have done Canifest. How was Prague. that? So yeah, okay. they're both, so just, I just, so my, this is just my opinion also, but like, so, but 
I just kind of frame the European market from those two experiences. And so there's very little, they, they don't want stuff the way Americans like stuff. Like I want, like Americans want stuff and things and the parts and the tools and the things and the kit and the whatever. And they're very, it's a very more, it's a much more simple, like consumption experience. There's a lot of joints um, being rolled. There's a lot of tobacco being consumed along with the cannabis um, people. There's not the brands in throughout Europe are all based on seeds. When it comes to like flour, um, there's, there's a market where you can buy seeds and that is legal, but other things aren't legal. And this is where this is what goes back to what I was saying earlier about this like patchwork of illegality that like you have to make sure your brand can kind of seep into wherever it's legal right now and then be able to like make inroads later as other dominoes fall. But like, yeah, so um, brands in throughout Europe, at least in my understanding and experience are based on the seed and genetics. And so, um, and then there's like growers and they sell them to the market and they talk about whatever this, wherever the seeds came from. And then people seem to primarily consume via joints um, or small glass devices, well, small smoke, smaller smoking devices. I, I mean, it's so exciting because uh, the one of the dugouts and one hitters I have looks a lot like a makeup compact. And like when I show it to someone who's an avid, avid flower user, um, who's like in that, like I showed this one woman who's like in her fifties and all her whole life has just rolled joints. And she, I, I was like, well, this is the pipe. And you just put the weed in the, do, 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 and then you like, and they're like, sometimes people's faces are so like, oh my God, that's another way I can, sp-. and it's so fun. Um, and that happened a lot in Barcelona, which was cool because there's not dugouts. There's not like, I went through all of Canifest in Prague. There wasn't a single dugout at a single booth. But are there are there edible options and vaping options there um, and they're choosing to remain flower users or are there fewer form factors than there are here? Oh, no, it's far fewer. I mean, there's not even I mean, there's not like kitchens. There's not the edible scene is is um, I mean, candidly, from what I can understand. Okay, so from my vantage point, the edible scene is some global brands that are like trying to start seeing how they would play in the European market, but there's like not a European market yet. Like there's not like license holders they can start formally partnering with yet, but they're trying to figure out a way to like establish themselves as a brand before the regulations all are go inevitably go into place. Um, So there's some presence of brands, but they're not, they don't exist there yet. Um, And then on the flip side, there's just, it's just whatever it was five years ago, right? Because they're like, I'm not saying people aren't consuming edibles and people aren't making edibles, but nobody's putting their address and Instagram handle on it. Like it's, it's all, you know, the people that did it before and sold it to the people they sold it to. And it seems like that's getting bigger, but, um, it's not branded. It, people don't want to be found. (laughs) People are waiting for, to see how this all evolves. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, Yeah. And I've never like, I, yeah, I think the seed thing is really interesting too. Like just wrapping my mind around that. That's just so not an American way to No, I know. And I, and I asked a lot about it. Well, it is. What's interesting is that like some of the original grower, I think some American growers would be like, would be like, what do you mean? It's all about genetics. It's all about our growing. And it's all about that. But like, Sadly, it's not, necess- and I feel that way. I agree with them because like when I, like we sell cannabis flower in mini joints and tiny little joints in five states. And all I care about is talking to the grower. I want to talk to the grower. I want to find out, I want to go tour their site. I want to see the plants. I want to pick, I want to see the terpene profiles. Like, and that's just cause I'm a nerd about it. But, um, most people aren't like that, but I think the European market would argue, but that means we actually care more about it because we really care about like what this plant is, what this strain is, where it came from um, and the genetics behind it. But yeah, no, it is interesting because, and I kept asking about it because it it was even confusing to me. I was like, so they're just selling the seed brand. And then I was trying to think of anything compared to that. Like, 
where you're like, but this, and it's kind of like a, you know, like the melon, a Rocky Ford melon, like that's the melon it is. Um, anyways. I mean, I see it in like, like the, the trade show floors where everyone's trying to like push genetics, but that's really the only place I see it. But, but it's akin to, you know, I'm drinking my Sauvignon Blanc. I'm not, you know, I don't necessarily care where the grape came from. I mean, maybe I should, but I don't, um, <laughs> you know, but I'm just a regular consumer. I'm not in it, um, in that way. So, yeah. So we went to Spain for, to Spanibus. I found, and I found my, like my favorite, I found a cannabis club there that I wanted to work with. They have like a real, they, they're in an art gallery setting. They support a bunch of local artists. Um, the person who founded it, Cedric was a, dj out of madrid for a long time and like and they just are like my people and so um we partnered with them and it was like the first time i got to like live out my actual like kind of vision because i got to like outfit the party so we outfitted the party and we had all of my cloud glass there and so that's what everyone was like consuming out of if they wanted to use you know like a watered filtered bong and so, um, and it was awesome. And so we got to uh, host those events um, at Choco Cannabis Club in Barcelona. And um, it, Spanibus brought a lot of people from all over the world um, out of the woodwork, which is great. And we made a lot of great connections uh, with people that are starting to establish distribution. And it's exciting because it's all very new. Um, and the people that are involved are really fascinating and if you're like kind of on your journey for your own reasons then you find your people and that's exciting. I love Spain. Um, and I love the coffee in Spain. It's so, I mean, it's, it's better than our coffee, uh-huh. um, except maybe your coffee. Want to <laughs> talk CBD about that? Coffee. Yes. Um, well, I'm drinking it right now and I drink it every day and it's my favorite product and it always has been. And so, um, so and what brought- is it? It's a CBD coffee. Um, so the, I just so um, as we enter 2018, and the primary questions we were receiving from our audience were regards to, in regards to CBD. I started looking into the products more and deciding like what I want to bring to market. And the whole time, I'm drinking CBD coffee. So um, one of the oldest companies that I'm close with in the space is Steep Fuse Coffee out of Boulder, Colorado. And they've been making the Devin and Ben have been making coffee there and roasting beans with full spectrum CBD oil um, for four years now. And so I met them and got their coffee and I've always consumed it. And so that was why I like, I knew I believed in CBD, but I was trying to identify what products I really wanted to bring into the space. And so, yeah, so I, I reached, so I was drinking CBD coffee a lot, but then as we decided to to like bring more products to market, I started trying a ton of CBD products, um, gummies and tinctures and, uh, balms and salves and all these different things. And then had, I have like my focus group of people who also try the products. And so the whole time though, I was like, God, I just, I love my CBD coffee. And so I reached out to Ben and Devin and was like, I want to bring Jane West CBD coffee to market. Like this is my favorite coffee. I have opinions about the beans and I have opinions about the ratio and I'd like to have my own exclusive blends and I'd like to have um, my own exclusive ratio in the bag. And I want to like start blowing out this coffee and they came to the table and were super receptive. And so that was one of my, that was my first like agreement in the consumable space. Um, And so, yeah, so my, what had always been my favorite CBD product. I now, I now sell as Jane West CBD coffee Um, it's a full bean, it's a whole bean coffee to be clear. You have to grind it. Um, but that's really part of the experience. Just like grinding flour is part of your consumption experience. Um, grinding those coffee beans and releasing all that full spectrum CBD oil that's been put into the beans at the final stage of the roasting process is really what makes the experience so premier. And so, um, yeah, so we have a CBD coffee and then in that journey, I also identified that I wanted one THC free CBD product because I just feel like there's so many people that are just never going to feel comfortable with this like trace amount that comes from CBD full spectrum oil. And so, um, for that, I went to Oklahoma Um, and I work with a group out of Oklahoma and a pharmaceutical grade facility and we make THC free capsules and those also come in day and night. And that's what I tried. 
Yes. I liked them. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I like those. I like those as well. Yeah. And you know, it's so exciting now because we just started our influencer program. So I just sent samples of the month of supply to like a dozen or so influencers in our network. And they're really, what I'm, what I'm really excited about is the universal positive like feedback we're getting because sometimes I, I was concerned that maybe, um, you know, a really heavy user or like, or that it might affect someone differently if they're like a, a primarily like a concentrate consumer or like doesn't, don't consume cannabis at all. Like how, like how will this affect as you start to mix all these other, how will my supplement affect what, how it feels with all these different groups that are consuming other forms of cannabis and all different, whether it's zero or a heavy user. And we're getting such great results from everyone. It's making me very excited. Um, the capsules are based in a moringa powder, which is a superfood and really helps for uptake. And I, my goal was to come up with a capsule that, like, what is the smallest amount of CBD that's going to make the biggest impact on your day? Um, and so we have 10 milligrams in the morning and 10 milligrams at night. And because I do think you should take it twice a day. I do think you should like titrate it and take it twice. And if you, if we, if I thought I could get people to take it four times a day, I would, but just it's a new habit people are do, using. So the day and night. It's also, ex, it's also expensive. It's not, it's oh, definitely, not definitely. inexpensive. Yeah, no, it, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And it's even more expensive when you're like producing the, the products in, in a more like commercial pharmaceutical lab tested manner. So, um, yeah, but it's exciting. So my two CBD products are CB Jane West CBD coffee and Jane West CBD capsules. The coffee comes in light and dark roast and the capsules come in day and night and they're available at jwcbd.shop as well as retailers. Well, there's like a dozen retailers carrying it now. Um, a bunch of groups that were carrying my, uh, dugouts. Uh, retailers and storefronts that were already carrying my glassware and dugouts were the first people I reached out to to start carrying my consumable products. And so um, about a dozen have picked them up, but we just got, we're just getting started. So that's exciting. Nice. Well, thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time. We do have one more question for you and then we'll set you free for your weekend. Um, so we do this segment every week called while you were sleeping. Uh, and we ask our get ask our guests, um, to tell us what's the, the one story that is just not being told or what's the one, um, if you woke up and uh, on the front page of the New York times was this headline, what would that be? Or insert paper of choice. <laughs> it is disappointing to me how little small business exists in the space right now. Extremely disappointing. Like one of the biggest motivating factors for me to found Women Grow way back in 2014 was what appeared to me to be accessibility to the market. Like I, we're sitting here in 2014, my, the, like my friend Julie owned a granola company and, you know, and other, like there were edibles companies and labs company, like, and, and accessibility in the market in Colorado was, and, and the way Amendment 64 in the state of Colorado legalized cannabis was so small business friendly um, that it was so inspiring because in my mind, just coming in out of nowhere into, you know, in, into the space, how could it possibly get more strict? How could that happen? We were the first people to do it. It's just going to get better from here, right? This must be the strictest way and the, and the heart, right? The biggest barriers to entry, whatever. And what I've seen as I try to find cannabis diversely held companies um, nationwide to be my cannabis partners is that like someone got there first, that's for sure, because the number of licenses that are being awarded, what it takes to get a license, how everything plays out after that, that like, oh yeah, there'll be a whole nother phase of licenses. Don't you worry. But yeah, when those come out, you guys are getting your whole next level of licenses. Like the advantages that are being provided to groups that have no differentiator other than capital and clout is very concerning. And people aren't talking about that. We're all now we've like flipped the switch with Canada 
and this is all just my own opinion, but I mean, we flipped the switch with the Canadian market where now like we just hurdled all, all of these conversations. And instead, now we're talking about, you know, market cap and trading floor and all these like no one even cares anymore. We're talking about how big we can make all these companies as fast as possible and who's doing what. And uh, like what's happening, like all of a sudden, you know, in the past couple months, maybe longer, I don't know, you'd know better than me, Lewis, but like. MSO is like a new word that we all use. Oh, it stands for multi-state operator. And like, that's a thing now, you know? And so what's happening in the space to me is concerning and disappointing because I had hoped that I would see an expansion of what Amendment 64 put in place in Colorado with access, far more access to the industry for small local businesses, because we have to grow this here on our own, like I want flour that's grown in Colorado, you know? And so, so these are small businesses being started. These is, this is an entire like cash crop that's being created on a national scale. And that could, that fairly soon is going to be able to be like imported and exported and traded. And I, I mean, it's amazing. Um, and what I've seen nationwide is just very, very concerning as I go out looking for diversely held companies to partner with and literally can't find any. Wow. You just totally bummed me out. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was like a you, great answer though. It was a great <laughs> answer. Maybe the best answer to any question that we've yeah. ever had. Um, so we're at the oh end. Oh my God. I'm going to take that to the weekend. We really do have to end, so you get you're gonna get the last word, Jane. Um, where can people find you? Where email, website? Where should okay, we be looking so, for yes, you? Okay, so yes, you can follow me personally and my life at the Jane West. You can follow the company and what we're building at Shop Jane West on Instagram. Uh, for the most part, I manage both those accounts, so you kind of like see what we're doing every day. And then you can go to janewest.com and there's links there's links on there to our blog and our different articles and some of the news pieces that I talked about during this interview. Um, and then additionally, there's a page about where to buy and that'll connect you through to the different sites of where to buy the products that I talked about on this podcast today. Awesome. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank this you. was great. Awesome. Our thanks again to Jane West. We'll put all of her beautiful products and where you can find them in the show notes. You can check her out at the Jane West and at shop Jane West on Instagram or online at her shop, jwcbd.shop. To chat with us, you can email us at greenrush at kcsa.com or we've got some new Twitter and Instagram profiles for you. So we're on Twitter at the underscore Green Rush and on Instagram at the green rush underscore podcast. So we made it really not confusing. That's it. Have a great day. One take Shay. One take.